hands uh, in the presence of the Lord as we sing a few songs for the glory of the Lord. Prepare ourselves, prepare our hearts before worshiping. Let us pray that the Lord would uh, bless us as we sing songs for His glory. This morning as we are in the presence of the Lord, let's pray that Lord, this is what I seek and this is what I desire. Just like the Sami says, this is what I seek, that I would dwell in the house of the Lord. So this morning as we are in the presence of the Lord, to dwell in His house, to worship Him. I seek is to worship him. One thing we ask of you, one thing that we desire, that as we worship you, Lord, come.
that be our prayer this morning. This is what I seek and desire, O oh God, that as we worship you, come and change our lives. We don't want to be the same again, just like we've come. We want to experience the touch of the Lord this morning, Lord, as we worship you.
to be lifted on high. What a privilege we have to call him as our friend, to call him as our God, the God who takes care of our lives. That's what he said in his word. Cast all your cares on me and I will care for you. And that's what we're doing this morning. Casting all our cares on him. For he's a true friend. He's a God who would never leave us. God who would never forsake us. God who is worthy to be worshipped. He is Lord. He is Lord, and He has risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee shall. Lord, 
just like we've sung, not just in our words, but Lord, through our life as well. May our knee always bow before you, Lord. May our tongue always confess, always declare that Jesus Christ is my Lord, is our God, to the glory of the Father. Our prayer is that, Lord, just like we've sung, this is what we seek and this is what we desire, that you would arise in our lives, O God. That we would live our lives for your glory, Lord. That the one goal and the one purpose that we would have is to live for you, God, live for you, live for your glory. For that's why you've called us and that's why you've saved us. That's why you have kept us on the face of this earth, Lord. That through our lives, we may declare your goodness and we may give you glory. We pray, O oh God, that you would use each lives, each lives, O oh God, each of us who are standing here, would be used in a mighty way, Lord. Shall we uh, open our Bible to Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, verse 21 to 26. I repeat, Gospel according to Mark, chapter 5, verse 21 to 26. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him, and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue came, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will be lived. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him and thronged him. Now a certain woman had a flow of blood for twelve years, and had suffer many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. So this is the time to listen God's word. To worship him, and we are here this morning as a, as a witness, as a testimony of God's doing in our lives. And I know if I give time for testimony, we all have one of the other testimonies of God's wonders, right? Each and every day that we live on the face of this earth is a living testimony or is a testimony of God's uh, great love. Uh, past week, the last one week was, uh, was a week of storms in my life. It started way, <laughs> way back on Sunday and it just, it just didn't get over. And uh, I was I was meditating on the on the word on the passage that we ha we we saw the other day, uh, you know, disciples and Jesus going on a boat and a and a big wind coming and the storm and they thought that that's the end, and that's exactly what I felt last week, and but praise be to God, God is a God who delivers us from storms, and uh, I could experience His uh, His His hand His power. And also, I could experience uh, many prayers uh, supporting us as we went through this difficult time in our lives. Mark chapter 5 and verses 21 to 43. And this, uh, this is a passage that is allotted to me for this, for this week. Last week, uh, Brother Roji gave a very wonderful exposition on um, the encounter that Jesus had with this demon-possessed man, this demoniac. He was self-destructing and also was destroyed by Satan. And also we find that after Jesus delivers him, 
Jesus is giving him a mission. You know, go to this place and this is what you got to do. You got to evangelize the people there. You got to uh, go to your neighborhood and tell them about, about the good news. And we saw that, you know, uh, at a particular place, Jesus would allow people to evangelize. But at a particular, at some other place, Jesus would say, hush, don't even say a word. In Jewish territory, Jesus would not allow people to say anything about him. Why? Because they would have wrong expectation about the Messiah. They would think that Messiah is all about, you know, healing and Messiah is all about uh, you know, demon or delivering the demons and, and that's it. But when he goes to, when it is in a Gentile territory, Jesus would ask, you know, go and tell your neighbors. And that's what we, we've been seeing. The passage that is being read to us this morning, it is kind of a sandwiched passage. Brother Roji, the other day when he was preaching, he also took a sandwich passage. Now, we all know what sandwich is, right? It's got two breads and, and two slices, and there is, uh, there is, you know, you name it, some vegetables, veggies, or something, and things in between. So this passage is a sandwich passage. You have a miracle within a miracle. And it is also, in technical terms, it's known as intercalation. Intercalation is what, what they call it. And throughout Mark's gospel, now that is one of the literary features of Mark. Yeah, we find around six sandwich passages, six sandwich passages. If, if somebody is noting it down, you can note it down. Chapter 3 and verses 20 to 35. In chapter 3, there is a sandwich passage, verses 20 to 35. Chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. Chapter 5, the passage that is read to us this morning. And chapter 6, verses 7 to 32. Chapter 6, 7 to 32. Chapter 11, verses 12 to 25. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 11. And chapter 14, verses 53 to 72. So these are the six passages uh, where the sandwich or the intercalation. Chapter 3, chapter 5, chapter 6, chapter 11, chapter 14, and chapter 14. This passage is a sandwich, or there is a sandwich of Jesus healing Jairus' daughter. And in between, there is an interruption. And Jesus is healing a woman who, was, uh, who had the issue of blood for around 12 years. In the passage that, is, that was before the passage that is being read before us, we saw how Jesus had authority over demons. And in the passage that we are reading now, it shows how Jesus is having authority over death, how Jesus has authority over diseases. And in the previous passages, we know how Jesus had authority over nature. You know, he calms the storm. He stills the wind. So in this brief five chapters of Mark, Mark wants to demonstrate who Jesus is. Jesus is, is Christ, the Son of God. He's not an ordinary man. You've got to believe on him. Is what Mark would want to tell the audience. Mark would want to tell the people. This Jesus is someone whom you should believe. So we can approach, when I was just looking at this, this story, I was thinking of what should be my vantage point or how should I begin this story. Now, to preach a narrative is, uh, is easy and difficult as well. <laughs> it's a story, you can just repeat the story. Or you've got to have a perspective from which you speak. So you can talk about or you can look at this narrative from the perspective of Jesus. You know, Jesus being available for, for these people. Jesus is there, he's accessible, he's available, you know, he works for the people. But something that, that I was reading and, uh, and, and it just took my attention was people who are in need, desperate people, and how they exercise their faith. You know, in our desperation, the amount of faith that we need to express, that we need to exercise, is what I found in this, in this, in this passage. From the eyes of someone who is in need. And how they looked at Jesus or how they approached Jesus. In simple words, now we know there's a definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11 and verses 1. But in simple words, what is faith? Faith is just, just complete trust, right? Or in other words, I would say blind trust. You know, you just close your eyes and you just, just trust on someone or something. It's just complete trust. So as we walk through this narrative this morning, we would see how these two people, are, or even three, because Jairus' daughter also had a faith. She obeyed Jesus, right? So these three people, you know, they put their faith in the Lord. 
and how their faith is is being is growing and how their faith is developing is what we're going to look at this morning now one of the perversions of sin is the distorted outlook of time let me repeat that one of the perversions of sin is the, is our distorted outlook of time you know why do i say that is we want things to happen in our own timetable isn't it because when i pray i would want the answer before i say an amen right i would want god to answer me and if it if that does not work accordingly my faith is you know it 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 gets limped my faith gets distorted or my faith is reduced so in this narrative what we're going to look at is the stages of faith now this is not a topical sermon i want to focus on this passage but this is what i studied when i was studying you know this is what i saw what are the stages of faith that we can develop that we can have as uh, you know as children of god as believers one of the first faith or first stages of faith is a hope you know you have hope and that hope leads to the initiation of faith you know, you, you have hope in something and that leads to faith you want put faith in something that you have no hope in isn't it so that hope leads to initiation of faith mark chapter 5 and verses 21 chapter 5 and verses 21 gives us a setting of this passage it says when jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea so we know that jesus uh you know is coming back to the western territory coming back to the jewish territory you remember he had gone to the other territory the other side he was crossing on a boat and there was a storm and he calmed the storm and then he had to meet just one demoniac just one person in that gentile territory ministry is done and he's going back you know a lesson that we can learn is even for one person jesus is available right jesus is there so he just crosses the sea and ministers to that one person and going back going back to the jewish territory and we find there's a crowd that is waiting for him are we looked at this crowd this crowd is not leaving this crowd is still there if you look at the passage in luke the parallel passage in luke the crowd was eagerly waiting for jesus to come back so that somehow you know they would have an experience of jesus because he's been healing people he's been doing so many wonderful things and they wanted an experience of jesus so they are waiting for jesus to come back and do the things that jesus was doing now this crowd is unlike the gentile crowd right the gentile crowd what did what did they say last week we saw they said could you please leave our town because you are a nuisance for us you know it would be good that you leave our town but this crowd unlike the other crowd is eagerly waiting there's a big crowd the other day when we were talking about i had asked a question are you a follower or are you a fan of jesus you know in that mark chapter 3 and verses 17 onwards in that we were seeing you know this big crowd they're waiting it's a big it's a great it's a large crowd crowd in our own definition you know could be a few in numbers but this is not that kind of a crowd it's a big crowd and this big crowd is waiting for jesus to come back and do the things that he was he was doing they were not interested in uh, in responding to the messages of jesus but they did want healings that jesus was doing or in other words i was just looking at this crowd the composition of this crowd they could be the first pursuers of prosperity gospel let me repeat that they could be the first pursuers of the prosperity gospel you know why because they've been saying come and give us give us right now this is what we need that's what prosperity gospel is all about right give us jesus will satisfy your needs and you limit jesus just to your needs and i find them as the first pursuers of the prosperity gospel all they cared for this crowd all they cared for was temporal all they cared cared for was for their own needs you know but in midst of this selfish fickle crowd there are those two people who stand out who make their way to find jesus these two people who were desperate to find jesus 
Now their story could be a great benediction to all of us. And it would show us how true faith in Jesus looks like. This morning, I again would want to ask the same question. Are you a follower of Jesus or are you a fan of Jesus? Are you one among the crowd or are you a true follower of Jesus? Because in that crowd, we find these two people. Now, there is nothing so common between both of them. Very interesting duo they are. No relationship that they had or they never knew each other. There's no reason that they would know each other. But Matthew, Mark and Luke, three of these synoptic writers, they place both of them together. They sandwich both these characters. A man and a woman. One rich, another poor. One respected, another rejected. One honored, the other ashamed. One leading the synagogue, the other was excommunicated from the synagogue. One with a 12-year-old daughter dying. Another with a 12-year disease, 12-year-old disease suffering. That exactly reminds me of Mary's Magnificat, thus the poem that Mary sings in Luke chapter 1 and verses 52 where Mary says, God was a savior who brought down rulers and exalted those who were humble. He brought down rulers and exalted those who were humble, putting both of them in the, on, on the same platform, on the same page. Here you have a ruler, here you have a woman who was excommunicated from the synagogue, both of them are on the same platform. There is no bias with Jesus. You know, there is nothing called, you know, the rich and the poor with Jesus. You're all the same. When you are in desperation, when you are in need, you're all the same. And that's what we find here. When Jesus was on this earth, it was a way. You know, that's what most of the synoptic writers portray his journey on the way. He was on the way, on the way to the cross on the way for the purpose for which he came. And on the way, he was meeting so many people. On the way, he was delivering so many people. On the way, he was accessible to many people. And that's what we find here. Accessible to people. On the way to the cross. Verses 22 introduces us to the first man. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came. And when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. Jesus was on the way. He was meeting the crowd and on the way, this man called Jairus, the synagogue ruler, came and met Jesus and fell at his feet. This is so surprising and shocking to me to find a synagogue ruler meeting Jesus. This man is not a Pharisee. This man is not a Sadducee, nor he is a religious leader. He is the administrator of the synagogue. He is the one who sees, who preaches. He is the one who oversees, who prays, and, and the proceedings of the synagogue. He is, he, is the, he is the administrator, a ruler of the synagogue. And he runs to Jesus and falls at his feet. Has he met Jesus any time before? I presume he met Jesus many times before. You remember the, the passage where Jesus was preaching in a synagogue and a demon-possessed man, he cried out and he said, Oh, holy one of God! That man was there because he is the ruler of synagogue. He's, he was sitting there. You remember the story of a man with a withered hand? These people had deliberately put that man in the synagogue. That man would have been there. That synagogue ruler would have been there. You remember Jesus preaching in a synagogue with authority? That man, that synagogue ruler would have been there. He was most likely present in the synagogue. And it's really surprising to me when this man came to Jesus. And it is all the more surprising to me is that when he came and he fell at the feet of Jesus, you know, a synagogue ruler, if he is seen by somebody who is known to him, he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. Why? Because this is what they wanted to kill Jesus. And here you go, you have a synagogue ruler falling at the feet of Jesus. Something that is incomprehensible. Something that they cannot even understand. This is clearly out of character of a synagogue leader that is falling at the feet of somebody who you want to kill. Of somebody who you say that he is a heretic. He fell at the feet of Jesus. And if you look at the parallel passage in Matthew, it says that he worshipped. He worshipped Jesus. The agony of this man, the urgency of this man is what we can find in verses 23. If you could please 
somebody please help me in reading verses 23 of this passage. Verses 23. Matthew 5, uh, sorry, Mark 5 and 23. Yes, please. He pleaded earnestly with him, my little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and she will live. That was the urgency. She, he was in desperate need. Come home, Lord. Put your hand on my daughter and I know that she will be healed. A synagogue ruler from out of the mouth of a synagogue ruler. Something that I am so surprised about. From out of the mouth of the one who opposed comes out these words of hope, these words of faith. That's what the power of the gospel is all about. It can change any hard-hearted person into very soft, soft person. That's the, the, the best example is that of Saul who turned into Paul. At one point of time, he was, he was, he was going to persecute the believers, the children of God and the persecutor became the persecuted. Why? Because of the transforming power of the gospel. And here you have this man who wanted to kill Jesus but there's a point where he finds that Jesus is all he has. All his sources, all his resources have been exhausted and there's no other resources that he has around and it is just Jesus that he can go to. Look at verses 24. And when he pleaded the urgency of his appeal and how Jesus responds to it. Yes, verses 24, please. Yes, verses 24 says, so Jesus went with him. Jesus is accessible, not like the preachers of this century, those, this, those modern preachers. You go to them and you ask them, come to my home and pray. And they would say, I am so busy. I have so many other appointments. I'm not, I'm, I'm not blaming anyone. Yes, of course, people are busy. We are busy. But Jesus was accessible. You know, he was in the crowd. He was in the crowd and he, was, he had a purpose. And on the way, here you go, he is met by Jairus. And he says, please come home. And he says, okay, I'm there. I'll be coming to your place. The accessibility of Jesus, the availability of Jesus. He was there. I can almost hear Jairus say, you know, my, almost my seventh grader is dying. He's, he's telling himself, he's saying to himself, but this healer, this Jesus has agreed to come home. And I'm so excited. He's telling to himself. And he says, you know, but there's, there's one hindrance. And that one hindrance is the crowd. You know, he's saying that we are on the way to home. And if it was today's, I, I'm just imagining if it was today, he would have called his wife and he would have said, you know, he's agreed. We are on our way. We'll be there in five minutes. Here you go and our daughter is healed. Very excited man. But you know what happens? There's a crowd. There's a crowd in front. It's, it's just like, you know, you are in the, in, uh, in the rear of a, or in the back seat of, a, of an ambulance. And you want to get to the hospital, but there's a big traffic jam. And you're not able to reach the hospital. And look at and how, how, what would you be your attitude? You know, what would be your, the, the pulse of your heart beat? And it, it was the same for this man. I can almost hear Jairus saying, should I remind Jesus? Jesus, I was the one who called you. First, let's go home. And then you come back and take care of the crowd. I can almost hear him say that. Because he says, Jesus, my daughter is dying. Any moment she can die. Please come fast and heal my daughter. His heart must be beating with joy and anticipation and excitement because he's seen Jesus healing and he's expecting a hope. He has a hope and that hope leads him to put his faith in Jesus. But you know what happens? There's an interruption. It doesn't work the way that he imagined it to work. We find an inter interruption in the narrative. And on the way to Jairus' home, there is an interruption. Verses 25. Verses 25, please. Yes, 
So Jesus with the crowd, crowd thronging around him. We, we, see, we saw in the other passage also, this crowd was a dangerous crowd. This crowd would have killed Jesus. Exactly, they would have killed Jesus because they somehow wanted to touch Jesus, you know, have a touch of the Lord. And they were desperate for, you know, healing or Jesus to do something. And you remember uh, an episode where Jesus asked his disciples to arrange for me a boat. If I am there, they would kill me because I am not going to die in the way they want me to die. I've got to go to the cross and die and die for their sins. So this is a dangerous crowd. They're all around Jesus. And you find as they are going, Mark is introducing us to an interruption. A woman who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. A woman who had hemorrhage for 12 years in the sea. Now, there's a lot, lot more detail about this woman in this passage. So much about this woman is being described. She had, verses 26 says, she had suffered a great deal under the, under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. Her condition was a medical failure. You know, we also say that no? we, we went to the best of the doctors, they failed us, and now it's all up to God. That's what some of our friends would say. She also was one case of a medical failure. Spent all that she could to be healed, but she didn't. And it was also a case of financial drain. You know, somebody has a medical issue, they would spend all of their money to get healed. And that was the same condition that she also had to financial drain. Everything that she had, that's what it says. She spent all she had. And also a case of deteriorating condition. It says, instead of getting better, she grew worse. She grew worse. A desperate woman. Medically failed, financially drained, the condition is deteriorating, she might die anytime. And she approaches Jesus. Apart from all these conditions, there were other conditions as well. Physically, she would be pale. For the constant loss of blood, she would be anemic. And also socially, you read the book of Leviticus, she would be unclean. And I, I wouldn't even imagine her to be married. because She would be unclean and she almost certainly was not married as she would defile her husband. And emotionally also she was drained. You know, for the past 12 years, it was not just one or two or three years, but for the past 12 years, she's been suffering. And there is no hope at all that she ever had. And spiritually also, she was an outcast. She wouldn't be entered or she wouldn't be, she, uh, I mean, she wouldn't be allowed to go into the temple. Why? Because she was unclean. Nothing she could ever do. But in her desperation, she meets Jesus. She could have had many excuses that she could have made. She would have said, I'm not that important to go to Jesus. You know, if I just go to Jesus, will he ever listen to me? You know, I am a woman who has been rejected by many. Now, how would Jesus accept me ever? She would also have this excuse that this Jesus is going with the ruler of the synagogue, with an affluent man, Jairus. If I go and approach him, will he ever listen to my plea? So I better not bother him. She could have said that. She also could have said that nothing that I have ever worked or nothing that I have ever tried worked. So why to try again? And I know that this will also fail. She could have had many excuses. She also could have said that it is, it is not good to go to Jesus at the last minute. I should have gone to him much before. You know, how many of us put off coming to Christ or a decision taking for Christ because we think it is not fair for us to go to Jesus now? Isn't it? Many times we reason it out. You know, what would Jesus think? What would Jesus say? If I go to him now, this woman had many reasons to not to go to Jesus. And she would have even said that when all else failed, why should I go to Jesus? But you know what? That's the moment that Jesus desperately seeks to hear from you. When all else fails, I will never fail. Come to me. And that's what happens here. He says, I love that. I love hearing that. You know, when all else fails, I am here. I'm still here. I'm still on the throne. I still can work for you. When everything else has failed you, I will never fail you. Jesus would love to hear that. 
She sets aside all her excuses and she comes to Jesus. Verses 27 and 28. Somebody please help me in reading verses 27 28. When she heard about Jesus, she came up from behind him in the crowd and touched his. She heard about Jesus. You know, conviction leads you to action. That's the second stage of faith. The first stage of faith is hope that leads you to initiate your faith. Hope. You have hope in something and the faith is initiated. Second stage is what we see in this woman. She's convinced. She knows. She heard. That this Jesus can heal and that leads us to do something extraordinary. How can an unclean woman go and touch a man who is clean? This is not being heard of. She tries to avoid disclosure. She tries to avoid further embarrassment from the, from the public and also resentment by the people. If somebody sees her, they would say, this unclean woman, she would make us unclean as well. She is sneaking in. And I can almost picture her, you know. She's trying to make her way from within the crowd just to touch the cloak of Jesus. To overcome her natural embarrassment and the fear of public shame, she kinds of make her, makes her way between the crowd. The way Luke describes it, he says, you know, she just, she just grasped it. It, it was, the touch was it. It was not just brushing it off. You know, he, she just grasped it. You know, Jesus could feel a power going from him. The touch was an intentional touch. You know, it was, she wanted to cling to the Lord. She wanted to grasp him. She wanted to hold on to the cloak. And it, it was a desperate, it was a desperate clutching with all kinds of thoughts going on in her mind. You know, I'm just imagining her. She wants to touch him and she touches him. But there are so many thoughts that are going on in her mind. What if somebody sees me? What if I don't get healed? What if somebody sees me and cuss me out from this place? All these sorts of thoughts going on in her mind. And she goes and touches him. And she, she clings on to the clock of Jesus. She thinks that if she just hangs on to the clock, she would be healed. This is not a superstition about a robe. This is not some kind of magic that if you touch a clock, you would be healed. This woman had great conviction that we can all have that kind of a conviction that we call as faith. A great conviction. Faith. If I put my faith, God can answer me. And she says, if I just touch, I'll be made well. All I need to do is to touch so with her hand, she touches the robe of Jesus. But with her faith, she touches the heart of Jesus. The faith that she had on Jesus, Jesus was moved with compassion. He was moved with pity. This woman, with that touch of faith, draws power from Jesus, whereas the rest of the crowd, they couldn't. They, they, there's so many crowd, right? So many people could have brushed Jesus' clock, but nobody got healed. It was this woman's faith, the convincing faith that she had, that she knew that if I touch him, I will get healed. Many people would have brushed across Jesus. None of them got healed, but this woman got healed. Some of you are here this morning, you know, waiting for a touch from the Lord. Every Sunday when I come here, that's what my prayer is. Lord, I need a touch from you. I don't, I, I, I don't need to go from here just like, just like I come in the same way I've come. I need a touch from you. And how could we touch him? It's through the worship that we make. Not just the words of the song, but the attitude. You know, we just tell him that, Lord, you are worthy to be praised. And I need to experience your touch, your power as I worship you, Lord. We experience his touch as we participate in the communion, in the holy communion. We identify with him. We, we identify with what he's done for us. But for some of us, coming to the service would just be a ritual. Coming to the service would just be a habit or a, 
some, sometimes purely social. But how many of us are here this morning, you know, you come to God's presence, you say that, Lord, when I go from here, I won't experience that touch. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about a physical touch. I'm not talking about a spectacular experience. I'm not talking about that. But, you know, God coming and touching you and your heart is stirred up. You're no more the same again. Before coming for prayer on Sundays or any, any time before coming for prayer, this should be our prayer. Lord, when I come for prayer, I need a touch, a special touch from you. Because you are my audience. You are the only one that I seek to please. You are the only one that I seek to worship. And here I am, desperate in need, in my desperation, want to experience your touch. The result we see in verses 29, verses 29, and it says like this, immediately her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Now, this is uh, Mark's special uh, literary feature. You know, he, he would use immediately a lot, this word immediately. Now, as I said, Mark is more dramatic in his, uh, in his, in, in the way he narrates the stories. You know, if you read the synoptic parallels, the Gospel of Matthew and Luke, they don't give much details, but he is giving much detail. It's just 16 chapters, but the way he puts it, this, this, this dramatic, uh, you know, elements in it. So he says, immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. She acted on her conviction, which leads to her confession. And now, verses 30, Jesus realizing, verses 30 says like this, at once when Jesus realized that power had gone, gone out from him, he turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? Verses 31, you see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you ask, who touched me? And I can imagine this could be Peter, right? I can well imagine if this is Peter, either Peter or who else it could be. You know, I guess it to be Peter. Yes, he would say, don't you see? It's a big crowd. There, were, there would be many people who could have touched you and you are asking this silly question, who touched you? 32, but Jesus kept looking around. He kept looking around to see he knew who touched him. Jesus knew who touched him. And I'll come to that in a while from now. And it says he kept looking around to see who had done it. Verses 33. Then a woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. And trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. Confessed. Told him the whole truth. Now here was a faith touched that reached Jesus right through his clothes. Jesus could experience some power going out of him. Some desperate person, you know, going to Jesus and touching him. He could experience that power going out of him. When I was reading this passage and I was just imagining, now that's not there in the Bible and I may be biblically, doctrinally wrong, but then this is what I was imagining. You know, when we pray, he would feel that, right? He would feel, this is a man in desperation. This is a woman in desperation. And his prayer is coming to me and I could feel a power going out from me you know that kind of an experience and then you know that conviction leads to her confession and the question why Jesus asked now when I read this for the first time I was like Jesus wants he's kind of a, you know that that orthodox preacher the preacher of the old you know who wouldn't want who wouldn't like disturbances in the crowd and he would point out people you know with this big rod or, or, or a pointed finger and I was imagining Jesus to be like that. You know, he wanted to embarrass this woman. And he wanted to say that, you know, how dare you? I'm going to the house of Jairus and you come, you come and touch me and you are a nuisance, you are a disturbance and he's pointing her out. No, it was not that. He asked this question for a particular reason, for a specific reason, three reasons. First reason is for this woman's sake, for her own sake, this woman's sake. He wanted to be more than a healer to this woman. He wanted to be a friend of this woman. Had Jesus not asked this question, this woman would have gone home without ever realizing. 
that Jesus is a friend and not just a healer. Jesus asked this question for this woman to realize, I am not just a healer, but I am your friend and I am your savior. You know, when Jesus healed her, he, he said, daughter, your faith has healed you. For the first time, she's hearing this from a respected person. She was never respected. People would chide her off. And here you go, you have a respected person, somebody, a celebrity of that time, coming and telling you that, daughter, your faith has healed you. It showed the woman that it was not just touching the clock of Jesus' body that she got healed. And I imagine... If that would have been the case, she would go home and she would say that it was the clock, the cloth that I touched healed me. For Jesus had to tell her, it is not the cloth that you touched healed. Your faith has healed you. If that had not been the case, she would go back home and she would, you know, she would try to have some cloth-like thing and she would always worship that cloth. Because this cloth healed me. But now she's going back home and she's thinking, I've got a savior. I've got a friend. I met a friend. When I was in need, I approached him and he's become my friend. It is not about the cloth. It is not about the clock. It is about my friend, Jesus. Jesus asked that question for this woman's sake. And by the way, she was the only woman to receive this title of daughter from the lips of Jesus. And also Jesus asked this question for the sake of those around him. Testimony. Others also, otherwise just imagine if this woman declared on her own self, I am healed. People would say, ah, you are just cooking up this story because you want to go to the synagogue. You wanted to go to the, or you want to have something to be done with the worship. They could have said that, but Jesus wanted to make it a public spectacle. Spectacle is a public thing for everyone to know that this woman is healed. For not her declaring, but Jesus declaring that this woman is healed. For others' sake as well. It's always good to share our stories. Isn't it? Many times we, we shy away from sharing our stories. But it's always good to share our stories of how God delivered us because it encourages others. And that's, what, that's, that's the point that I'm coming next. And that is for the sake of Jairus. Jairus needed to hear this, right? And all through this way, I am imagining about Jairus. He'd been saying that my daughter would have been dead by now. Like it's, it's quite some time. Jesus, I am the one who called you and you've got to be home. And look at you here. You're spending time with this woman and let, let her go off. She's otherwise also she's rejected and dejected and nobody cares for her. Let her die. But I am here to invite you to my home. But Jesus wanted to tell Jairus, wait, wait. Your desperation, your faith can be worked. Jairus also needed all sorts of encouragement. And he got the encouragement that you can trust Jesus. Just like I said, we can share our stories. We need to share our stories. That's what Paul says, that we comfort one another with the comfort that we received. Isn't it? So telling the story about Jesus' miracles, Jesus' deliverance to others would encourage the people in their walk with the Lord. I love sharing stories. I, I really love doing that. But not, maybe not in the social media or maybe not to make many people uh, listen to it. But at least one person who is in need. I would, I would love to share the story of how Jesus changed my life, of how he worked for me. I would love to share the story. And that would be one of the reasons. So Jesus asked this question from this woman deliberately for three reasons. For her own sake, for the sake of others around her, and also for the sake of Jairus who needed an encouragement. Verses 32 and 33, but the woman fearing and trembling of what had happened to her, fearing and trembling. Let me stop there for a minute. This is not a fear of embarrassment. This is not a fear of hostility from the crowd, what the crowd would say. 
This is not the fear of what Jesus might say. This is the fear. This is kind of a holy fear. I realize who this man is. He's not just Jesus, a man. He's not just Jesus, a person from Nazareth. He's Jesus, the son of God. That was holy fear. It was a holy terror. She was afraid because she knew what had happened to her. Because a divine touch she could experience. She knew that in a split second, things changed. He's not an ordinary man. She was fearful and trembling. She was trembling. Because she had an awe of God. She had an awe of the Lord. And that's what the text says. She is in the presence of a divinity, of a deity. <coughs> this is not human embarrassment. This is holy fear. This is the same fear that Manoah had when he came home and he said to his wife, we are going to die because we saw the Lord. We're going to die. This is the same fear that Ezekiel had. This is the same fear that Isaiah had. They would say that we, we, we're going to die because we saw the Lord. And that's the same fear that this woman had. And she's, she's being fearful. And she said, I could experience the touch of the Lord, the divine touch of the Lord. Now what happens next? I do not know because I am in the presence of the Almighty God. Or John the Apostle, when he saw the vision, he was just like a dead, dead man. He was just like a dead man when he saw the Lord. What is our attitude when we experience the touch of the Lord? And we say, ah, it happens everywhere. He is one of the person, you know, he could. Or it just leads us to, you know, that holy fear. You know, holy fear of the Lord. Many times, especially in the New Testament modern age, we take Jesus for granted. Okay, it's, it's good. Jesus is our friend. Jesus is everything. Okay, he is, he, he, he is there when you call out to him. But many times we imagine him to be an app. Just like I had said many, many uh, sermons ago. That he's just like an app. Just touch that app and he would answer you. Or he's like a person in our pockets. Just call on him anytime. And how many of us have that holy fear? God, the God of all creation. God, God who should be revered and worshipped, he's touched me. He's touched my life. And that causes me to worship him. That causes me to praise him. That causes me to just be on my knees. That causes me to humble myself because I've been touched by this great God. And that's what happens to this woman. So we looked at two stages of faith. The first stage was hope that leads to initiation of faith. Second step that we looked was the conviction. She was convinced that lead her, led her to act on the faith that she had. She acted it out. She, she did something extraordinary. And the third thing, the third and the last stage is the assurance that leads to perseverance in faith. Assurance that leads to perseverance in faith. I'm thinking of poor Jairus all through this episode. You know, when I was reading this, I'm thinking of that man, that poor man. You know, many times this happens to us as well, right? It happened to me many times where, uh, when I'm you know, talking to a big pastor or a big celebrity kind of a pastor, you know, <laughs> and I'm talking to them and I approach them and after a while, you know what happens? That pastor slips away and he's talking to someone else and I'm here I'm saying, and I'm like, okay, I've we had an audience and I was talking to you and then you are somewhere else and now what is going to happen to me? And you know, that kind of a situation Jairus also was going through and he, he would be like, Jesus, I was approaching you and we were going home and what, what's happening now? And he must be presuming or assuming that my daughter is dead. That's what he must be thinking or her life is slipping away. It was torturous for him to see Jesus catering to others' need, but not his own need. God is never slow, but he seems slow to the sufferer. You know, when we suffer, it seems like God is slow, but he's never slow. And that's what this episode of Jairus would teach us. To Jairus, God was slow. God should have acted the moment when I approached him. But God is never slow. 
Jairus was becoming more anxious and disturbed with every, every passing moment that was ticking by. Just like I said, he must be sitting on the back of the ambulance and sitting and thinking when this crowd is going to go so that this ambulance reaches my home. And as they were going, the words that he was afraid to hear, he heard it. I was imagining Jairus in that state. He never wanted to hear these words that your daughter is dead. If you and I were in the position of Jairus, we would have said, Lord, time is up. We are done. There's no more hope. Let's go back home. You go and do your ministry. I'd go back home and I'll bury my daughter. He must have told himself that I knew that Jesus is taking a lot of time. I knew Jesus would, shouldn't have wasted this time on this silly woman. Now the situation is beyond hope. Now there is no hope at all. Perhaps you must have heard this phrase. God is never late. He's seldom early. He's always on time. Let me repeat that. God is never late. He's seldom early. He's always on time. And I'm going to add something to it. He can always be trusted. He can always be trusted. And then he hears these words of assurance from Jesus that we find in that red passage. Verses 36, overhearing what they said. Okay, but let me read from verses 35. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? 36, overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Just believe. How is it possible? How is it possible? Humanly speaking, my daughter is dead. And you're asking me not to be afraid? You're asking me to be rejoicing? How is it possible? It almost sounds cruel, right? For Jesus to tell this man who's just lost his daughter. But Jesus knew that fear and faith, they don't go together. Either you will have faith or you will have fear. You, can let, you can't let both of these travel together. If you have faith in Jesus, you've got to let go of the fear. Now that is a difficult task, a difficult task. You've got to trust on the one who's called you. You've got to trust on the master. And you've got to let go of the fear. Before Jairus could trust Jesus, he had to let go of the fear. And second, Jesus said, Two things. One is, do not be afraid. And second thing, only believe. Only believe. Luke adds, in the parallel passage, Luke adds, she will be well. If you believe, she will be well. The words of assurance, she will be well. Just believe. He's saying, don't try to be afraid and believe at the same time. Either you've got to be afraid or you've got to believe. Don't try to believe and figure it out on your own self. Don't try to believe and and make sense of the delay. Instead, just believe. Just have faith. Just close your eyes and believe. That's what it is. Faith is all about that. Don't put in your logics. Don't try to work it out on your own way. Jairus had come to the end of his rope. He had nothing else. Nothing else left for him. You know, his daughter is dead. Nothing to depend upon, nothing to lean upon, but just these words of Jesus at the end of his rope. Many times we have come to such situations, right? At the end of our ropes, when everything else fails, just the words of Jesus, just the promises of the master. He just says, just believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. But many a times we try to figure it out through our own reasons. But he says, just believe. Let me quickly move. Verses 37 to 41. 
He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, his trios. He wanted to increase their faith as well because they're going to do much more than what Jesus did. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion there. With people crying and wailing loudly, he went in and said to them, Why all these commotions wailing? This child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. The perspective of Jesus, the eternal perspective of Jesus. You know, we are not dead. When we die, we are not dead. We have another life. Those who are dead in Christ shall live again. And that's what Jesus wanted to put in perspective. And when people look at those things, they would laugh at you. When you and I, when we go through trouble and problem and we tell people we trust on the Lord, people will scorn at us. When we tell them that, you know, we trust on the coming of the Lord, we know that Jesus is going to come back again, they would mock at you. And that's what they did here. That's what they did here. Jesus said, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And after he put them all out, he took child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talita kumi, little lamb, little girl, I say to you, get up immediately. Again, the word immediately, immediately. The girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. And we know that they were these mourners, they were mourners, people, they were being hired there to mourn. And Jesus lets everyone out. There are many times when we have to let people out. Let those people who make commotion in our lives, let them out. And just trust in the Lord. Just trust at his word. Because there'd be a lot of commotions. People would say so many things. People would say that now it's a time to bury this girl. She is dead. But Jesus let everyone out. And only Peter, James, and John, because he wanted to develop their faith. And also the parents. And, and the language in the other synoptic that it says like this, you know, he touched both the parents and let them in. And then he's touching this, woman, this, this daughter and he says, little lamb, rise up. And he heals or he resurrects or raises up that girl. What kind of faith do we have in Christ? It's a question that I want to leave this morning to all of us. We pray, we sing songs, we have words of assurance, we read the Bible, but do we have that kind of faith that this woman had, that Jairus had? God could have acted the same moment when he delivered that woman. God wanted to develop the faith of Jairus. It was a process. He had to wait. He had to wait when everything was or came to a close. He had to wait when the world said, it is over, it is done, it is finished. He had to wait till the last moment. And Jesus said, do not be afraid, just believe. This morning, I do not, do not know who I am talking to. But there are some here, you've got, to, you've got to work on your faith. You've got to work on your faith. I was a person who, who always used to be critical on faith. I used to be a very big critic on faith. Faith, faith. I would say, what faith? No, it is just, you know, you just, you don't see things and how can you just believe and faith and especially the faith healers, the faith, you know, the faith community, you heal, you do so many things and I, I know there are so many theatrics that goes with the faith thing. I'm not talking about that, but I was a, I was a big critic of that, this thing called faith. But I realized when I read this passage, I realized, I got to have that faith. You know, where I am to the end of the rope and it's just the last resort is Jesus. You know, I, I tell him that, Lord, you are the one. You are the only one that I can cling to. You are the only one that I have. That's what, that's the faith that Jairus exercised. That's the faith that this woman exercised. There were many in the crowd. They were not one among them. They stood out. They stood out. For Jairus to exercise his faith, he had to let go of his title. He had to let go of his position. He had to let go of the fear that what others would say, they might even kill me. But I am putting my faith on him because I've seen what he does. And for this woman, she also could have been killed. 
because she's contaminating this big crowd. She's making all of them unclean. But that conviction that this man can heal us leads them to act in faith. And the words of assurance from the Lord lets them to persevere in faith. Many times we don't perceive it, just like I've said. You know, we would want God to act <coughs> according to our own timetables. We would want God to say or answer us the moment when we want to hear the answer. But God says, you know, you've got to have some more moments of developing your faith. You know, he gives those episodes where we can just trust on him. Keep trusting on him. Let's all close our eyes as we look to the Lord in prayer and make a commitment before God this morning. <coughs> I want to pause for a moment and, and give all of us a few minutes to renew our commitment with the Lord. The Lord is asking us, how much faith do you have in me? Do you completely trust me? Are you still afraid of the things around you? Do you still believe that I can save? that I can deliver, that I can work on your behalf, that I can hear your prayers, that I can answer all those unanswered prayers. Do you still believe that? Can we take a commitment before God this morning that Lord, I've read in your word that you are a great God. That there is no one like you, but many times I waver in my faith. Lord, thank you for these stories of Jairus and the woman with bleeding for 12 years. Which tells us, Lord, that you work in individual lives differently. For you immediately heal the woman, Lord. But for Jairus, it took some time. Many times when we look at people around us, they get their prayers answered. But when we look at our own lives, Lord, we have to wait. And many times that makes us question as if you are, are you answering our prayers? As if our prayers are ever going to get answered. Thank you, Lord, for telling us this morning the Jairus had to wait, wait for long. Even when the hope faded away, he had to wait. We pray for perseverance, Lord, with the help of your Holy Spirit, that we may persevere in our faith, that we may not give up, O oh God. That we may hang on to you, Lord, no matter what. For we know that, Lord, you have a beautiful future for us. For all those who are sitting here, oh Lord, you have a beautiful future for all of them. Lord, we pray, help us increase our faith. Lord, we pray, help us increase our faith. Not for our own praise, not for our own glory but Lord, so that we could testify to others that our God is able, that our God is a mighty God who is able to deliver, who is able to save. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. This is the time for us to give our offerings and